I am Elle Penelope, author of Epic Fantasy and Paranormal Romance, and welcome to My Imaginary Friends, a look behind the scenes of an author mapping the worlds in my head and making them a reality. Hello friends, today is Saturday, February 6th, 2021, and this is episode 106 of My Imaginary Friends. I'm Leslie. This episode is sponsored by The Duke Heist by Erica Ridley. It's the secret identities, forbidden lovers, opposites attract romance from the New York Times bestselling author, which asks the question, why seduce a duke the normal way when you can accidentally kidnap one in an elaborately planned heist? Y'all know I love heist right now, right? Plus, I binged Erica Ridley's entire Dukes of War series in about a week, so she's definitely a go-to author for me. Fans of Leverage will love this Regency tale about a group of talented orphans adopted by a wealthy baron, Umbrella Academy style, with no superpowers, just the unique skills to carry out capers and help those who cannot help themselves. Plus, romance! Get your copy of The Duke Heist by Erica Ridley at your favorite store, or visit ericaridley.com for more information. There's a special bonus for a limited time. If you buy The Duke Heist and register your purchase on Erica's website, she'll send you a free bonus Winchester novella. So go to ericaridley.com, E-R-I-C-A-R-I-D-L-E-Y.com. So this week's best thing is that I got paid. There is, there was a TV show called The Birthday Boys that came on, um, I think, IFC, and it was a big comedy troupe, and my husband loved that show. They took it off of all streaming services, but they had this sketch where they got paid, and it was about paychecks, and they had this whole song about, give me the paychecks, give me the good stuff, give me the checks, and it feels like a little weird, like polite society doesn't like to talk about money, and especially authors don't like to talk about money, but it is always nice to get paid, right? So the Macmillan royalty checks um, or payments came out, I get a direct deposit. And I also got paid for the Under a Winter Sky anthology, since the retailers generally pay you uh, two months after the fact. So the book came out in November, checks come out in January, and since it was an anthology, um, Jeffy Kennedy is actually the publisher, so it's on her to, you know, calculate everything and divide up the money and send out the payments. So I got two payments, and it just feels great. Author Kwame Ambalia uh, had a, a post on Twitter asking authors when they first realized that writing could be like a career. Um, was it in a class or something? And I responded that, yeah, I took lots of writing workshops and classes, but I never got the idea from any of those that I could actually feed myself and house and clothe myself by writing books. That didn't happen until my 30s, Actually, really, once I joined RWA, my local RWA chapter, and, you know, I went to my first meeting, and I sat around in a big circle of tables at the library where we met around just normal, average, middle-aged women who had children and families and, you know, mortgages. They were just like me. And at the beginning of the meetings, it was like, okay, who sold a book? Who sold foreign rights? Who, um, you know, had a new release? all these questions and people were raising their hands and talking about their new books. And, you know, this was being published in France and Spain and they sold audiobook rights and -and so-and-so got an agent. And I was just like, whoa, okay. This is a thing that actual real people do. People who live in my neighborhood or in my county or, you know, locally. It's not just like New York and LA. I don't know what I thought about authors, really. And then I was like, oh, so you can actually make money and be a normal person and do this. Very few of them were full-time authors. Um, And it being RWA, a lot of them were like housewives or, you know, had a a partner or spouse who paid the big bills. But even that, you know, like, not all of them. I mean, there are plenty of full-time writers who are in, in, in all, di- all different kinds of genres who are making, you know, real money with their writing. And so, yeah, it is nice to get paid. And looking through my royalty reports, um, so I did actually earn out on Song of Blood and Stone. Earning out your advance means you have made back the money that they paid you, that the publisher paid you in the beginning, your advance. And now everything else is pure profit. The other two books that are out now have not earned out, but there's hope that one day they might. You know, the first book in a series is always going to sell way more than any other book does. 
um, I get, you know, messages all the time about like, I, I've seen your book or I even had your book for two years and I just read it. So, you know, there's either the people who will never read it, who actually buy it and will never read it, the people who read it and don't want to go on with the series. And then the people, it just takes them a long time to get it. And then maybe I'll, come, you know, read the next book in the series. And I do think that when all four books are out and people know that it's a complete series, they don't have to wait at all, then, you know, I would hope or kind of expect that it might pick up a little bit also. And I'm going to have to try to think of like marketing things to do and be like, complete series, it's all done. You can binge the whole thing. That was actually my original plan when Earthsinger Chronicles was self-published to market the first one tell people about the second and third one, but really wait until the fourth book was out to do a big push and be like, read it all, just have at it, binge. So in announcements, I wanted to announce the podcast giveaway winner for my 100th episode giveaway, which lasted all January. So the winner is Emily S. And I will email Emily and she will get the signed book of her choosing. So thank you to everyone who entered the giveaway. I will be doing another one shortly. I was uh, gifted a book that looks really cool that I want to give away. So uh, I don't actually, (laughs) I forgot to bring it up here today. So we'll do that next week. Other announcements. Um, Pharaoh Feb is going on, Fantasy Romance February. So definitely check out their website, pharaohfeb.com. They're on Instagram. There's lots of author spotlights. There's lots of events. I will be participating in an event, a panel discussion on Saturday, February 20th, and I will put a link into the show notes for that. That should be fun. Yeah, I did my spotlight on February 3rd, and (laughs) that was an ordeal. Not an ordeal, like I did a video. I thought a video would be easier than writing everything out. And then I I forgot that Instagram only lets you do one minute videos, so it cut off, but it cut off at a nice point. So I was okay with that, because at that point, I had decided to put captions in the video, and that was its own ordeal. Uh, I posted the whole whole thing on Facebook, so at least you get to see it somewhere in its entirety. It's only like two minutes long. I actually did the captions in Descript. So Descript is a software that does AI um, transcripts, and it will also do videos. You can actually edit video and audio via the transcript, so you can cut out the words and it edits the audio file or the video file. Now, it's costs money, but I have the free version, which gives me three hours of free transcription. And I used that because the video was two minutes long. And so it actually worked really well. Like if I was doing transcription on a regular basis and um, wanted to pay for that, I think it would be a good way to do it. The problem is I talk very fast. And so the, <laughs> the automatic transcription needs a lot of cleanup. And I just talked about this, you know, maybe a year or so ago, trying to do transcripts, but it would just be so time consuming for me in terms of the weekly podcast. YouTube does do automatic transcribing. I know it's probably terrible and I would like to do it, but it's just not feasible for me right now with, and, you know, in terms of doing like a clean transcription, cleaning up the, the AI version and getting it out regularly. But as someone who did study for a year to be a sign language interpreter, and didn't obviously finish because it takes longer than a year. Um, I'm cognizant of the, you know, accessibility issues and I would like to do better. It's just sometimes it's cost prohibitive and time prohibitive to do that. The tools are making it easier every day. So, and last announcement, I am on episode 219 of the ROM book pod, the inclusively yours uh, romance book podcast, where I chatted with Danny and uh we had a really cool conversation so if you want to check out that i have no idea what i said (laughs) i can't listen to myself on other people's podcasts very rarely like i did it i i'm happy to be on people's podcasts but it's hard enough to listen to myself talk every week and edit this um so yeah but it's out there i'll link to it in the show notes and you can enjoy it if you would like to (laughs) writing update So as of yesterday, I am at 47,427 words in the 1920s fantasy heist manuscript. I got through the midpoint, the big scene that I talked about last week. It did take a lot out of me. I actually had to split the chapter into two chapters, so it took even longer than I thought it was going to take. But then, as I was lamenting that, as I moved into the next chapter, I realized, oh, I can combine two other chapters. So it ends up being the same number of chapters. I'm still at 29 chapters. 
and uh, I'm only a couple of days behind my schedule. And it's really interesting. So I was writing chapter 14, I think, and I was talking to my friend about how great it felt. Like, I love this chapter. It just came together so great. And then I started on chapter 15, and it was the exact opposite feeling. I was like, this is drudgery. I am not enjoying this. This chapter has to happen. I can't cut it. I, I need it to get into the next thing, which when I got to the next thing, I liked it again. <laughs> it was just this up and down sort of manic feeling. I hate this. I love this. This is wonderful. And I was just being, you know, just having whiplash about the whole experience, which is par for the course. Like, it happens. But it was just so funny because literally the day before I had been talking about how great the scene was and I just love these characters and the way they were interacting and everything felt great. And I should have known that I had spoken too soon. And then it was like three or four days of drudgeries. I like tried to figure out what was happening. I don't know why I didn't like that scene. And I, I have a feeling it'll be one of those things where I look back in a year and I'm not going to remember not liking writing that scene. Sometimes when you come across a scene that is difficult to write and that you hate, you really need to take a step back and, and be like, is something wrong here? Is it the story? Is it the motivations? And it wasn't even that I was blocked. There was some pr procrastination in it because I actually didn't want to write the scene. And I sat down, forced myself to do it. And I got through it and I revised it. I think I have one more pass left to go on it. And it's fine. It, it needs to be there. It sets up something that's very important because um, it's like the first half of the chapters that I split into two. So chapter 16, the second half of it, I love. Chapter 15, I don't. And I wonder if it was just because I had to really figure a lot of stuff out that, and I didn't know going in and it was difficult and it was like taxing emotionally and creatively. But it did feel like drudgery. It was like writing the words, um, it was also taking place in a factory, sort of, and I don't, I don't know how to make the thing they're making in the factory. And I did a little bit of research, just enough to, to get by, because the character doesn't know how they make the stuff either. So she's walking through, she's looking at machinery, and she doesn't know what it is. I don't really need to know what it is, but maybe I would feel better if I actually did. But that felt like more procrastination, you know, like I could research exactly how they make this thing and become an expert in it. But my character still does not going to know that. So it it's not necessary for the words on the page. I do think the way I write it would have made me feel better about it. So there is a bunch of things happening. There's also some magic system stuff that I still haven't quite figured out. And I'm going to have to figure out in the last pass because uh, I'm introducing sort of a new almost a new aspect of the magic. It's something that I have actually laid the groundwork for earlier. And that was nice because it's one of those things where I didn't realize I was laying the groundwork until I got to this. And I was like, oh, I can use that. I had this little seed of a thing that I wrote and I didn't know why I wrote it. And now it's like, that's why I wrote it. But it's still a little seed and I still don't know the ins and outs of it. So I guess I'm saying like, I'm the kind of writer that I feel best when I know the ins and outs of everything. And that is not always possible. So when I don't, and I kind of have to fake it, I feel like I'm faking it, and I feel inauthentic. And I hope that doesn't show up on the page. Sometimes it will, and sometimes it won't, I think. But, um, yeah. Just that sort of going back and forth between these two extreme opposites of the emotions of how I felt about what I was writing. It was exhausting. <laughs> Other writing news, I am still going through the past pages for Requiem of Silence, book four of Earthsinger Chronicles. I had given myself 55 pages a day to go through to get to my deadline, and usually I end up doing more, but then yesterday I didn't do any, so <laughs> it's good that I'm ahead. Um, reading through it, you know, as many times as I've read through that book, I know I really love it, but this time I think it's just it's feeling a little tedious. And now I'm like, oh, is this really as good as I think it is? Because it's the 90 millionth time I've read it. And even though it's been, you know, a couple of months, I guess, since the last time I read it, like there's things that I like about it, but maybe, and I could just be having a week where everything feels like drudgery, you know, like after that high of chapter 14, everything's just felt like work. So reading through the past pages, reading, 
reading really carefully, kind of proofreading it, it does feel like work. It's not like reading the book. I think if I just had to read the book as an enjoyable thing, like any other book I would read, I might feel differently. But, um, you know, I find little things to fix here and there, little wording changes, some repetition, which I try to, uh, try to fix, like the echoes when I use the same word, like twice in the same sentence or twice in two sentences. Having fresh eyes helps with that. And that's something that a proofreader won't catch and like the copy editor didn't catch it. So I feel it's the onus is on me. And when I don't catch it and I read the final book, it drives me crazy. So, and, and, and part of it I think is, I'm just ready to be done with that world. Like this is the last thing I have to do for Earthsinger for a little while in terms of just de delving deep into the book, being in the world, holding it in my head, making sure that I've hit everything. This is the final pass to the final book. And I've already had the catharsis of finishing the book. So now it's just like, oh, I don't really want to go back <laughs> as much as I love the world. And I actually am already thinking about like, oh, I could do a story about this. I could do a story about this in the future. Not right now. I still need space from Earthsinger. So get through these past pages and then I'll have, I have more time to have more space from it. And then maybe be able to come back to some of those like spin-off type of ideas at some point in the future. There was a little bit of controversy in the writer world. I don't know if in the romance world, I guess. Uh, there was a book that came out that had a cartoon cover with two black people on the cover. And it looked like it was a new pen name for an author. There were no author photos. There was just an author logo. And the first person I saw who talked about it was Chelsea from Melanin Library. Shout out to Chelsea. Um, and kind of saying support black authors during Black History Month. By the way, this book was not written by a black person and showed the author photo, which is a very white presenting person. And then I only glanced in at the beginning of this, so I'm not like the authority on the situation, but I saw someone else tweet that this author was talking about this on her Facebook page. So of course I went to the post and read the replies that were there at that time. This was early in the week. So the, the issue was that this was a pen name for an author. Their first pen name has a photo attached to it. And so it wasn't like this was a secret because the first pen name was promoting this book by the new pen name that did not have an author photo attached, that had a book ostensibly about black people. And f the assumption had been that a black author had written it. Now, authors are not under any obligation to show their faces. You know, there's lots of reasons for having a pen name and for not wanting your identity to be public. This is not one of those cases because obviously she was fine with having her identity be public for her other pen name. So it felt like something shady was going on. Book drops February 1st, first day of Black History Month. There was some understandable confusion and bad feelings because it felt like something that was done maybe in bad faith. And then I went to this woman's Facebook post and um, it was basically like highlighting a bad review of the book that apparently someone who had found out that it was not written by a black person called it literary blackface, I believe. I gave it a one star on Amazon. And so the author came talking about how she had been attacked because was, she was a white woman who wrote two black characters. Uh, she had written the book because it was a pre-made cover that she bought and loved and wrote the story. She said that she had apparently a black editor and sensitivity reader who gave the okay on the story. It then goes on to say that, quote, I have been told not to write POC characters before. I never will again. I wanted to broaden my own horizons. I read, studied to prepare for this book. I wanted to make someone smile when they saw I wasn't afraid of writing characters other people don't write about. And yet it seems I failed. I have made my position very clear on this before. I think people should write whatever they want to write and then be prepared to face whatever consequences come. I don't think we should say, don't write this or don't write that. I think we should say, be very careful. And if you do it, other people are going to have something to say about that and be prepared for that. So a white writer finds a pre-made, wants to write a story with two black characters. Okay. Wants to release it the first day of Black History Month. Okay. <laughs> wants to write it under a pen name that does not have any pictures of herself on it. 
okay, and then cries fragile pale tears about it when she gets called out about it. Yeah, no, see the beginning where I said, write what you want and then face the consequences. And there were plenty of people of all races in her comments on different sides of the issue. You know, there were people, you know, black and white saying, you know, F the haters, write what you want to write, you know, just supporting her, don't listen to them. And then there were people on the opposite side. In my opinion, just my opinion, the problem wasn't in writing the book with black characters. I don't think that in and of itself is literary blackface. That's extremely harsh. And uh, that's just not something that I, I agree with. The problem was in her reaction to being called out on it. The perception of subterfuge, the perception of this pen name is presented as, you know, possibly being from a black author because there was no picture. There was no way of, of knowing when it wasn't a secret pen name because you talked about it with your other pen name. And then this, woe is me, people told me not to write POC characters, I never will again. Like, okay. There were great responses in the comments. A friend of the show, Kenya Gory Bell, shout out to Kenya, had a comment that I thought was, kind of hit the nail on the head from my perspective. She just talked about how, um, you know, have not, having not read the story, we can't really judge. But if your story is trauma porn about black people and the conflict is based in their blackness, then that's basically not a story that you are equipped to tell. No one is saying, don't ever write characters of color. I would say if you're writing characters of color and the point of the book is racism that they're experiencing and their reaction to it, why are you writing that? Again, Write what you want, but there are going to be very steep consequences for that decision. And then if it's just, you know, a story that could have been anybody uh, and you just made them black and there's no other, <laughs> there's nothing culturally or personally, uh, emotionally in their experiences or in the story that that uh, is feels black to black people, you're also going to get feedback about that. And as well, you should, you know, like... We put things out into the world and they become the audiences. So you either put them out standing behind what you did and willing to listen to the feedback. If someone comes at you and says, you know, I think that you did this wrong. I think that this was hurtful. I, I had this reaction for X, Y, and Z reasons. Then the onus is on you to at least listen to that, to hear it and take it in and then decide what you're going to do after that. This reaction was a problem, in my opinion. And uh, apparently she took the book down. I didn't really look into it anymore after that, after my initial uh, perusal of the, the post in the comments, but I did see a, a, someone tweet about she took the book down. Consequences, they are a real thing for most people. Maybe not Republicans, but you know. If she was sincere and took the steps, had sensitivity readers, studied and educated herself in some kind of way about <laughs> writing black characters, then she would be able to stand up for what she did. And considering the fact that she did not stand up for what she did, she must have felt that she, what she did was wrong because it seemed like there was just as much support for her as there was criticism. And, uh, you know, you're not going to make everybody happy. That's just impossible. But if you know in your heart that what you did was wrong and that what you did was shady and that you were trying to hide behind something, you know, then that's probably the right decision to take the book down. We are in interesting times. We are in difficult times for people navigating these questions of race and marginalization and who can tell what story and who has the right, you know, I continue to be an advocate for, for radical free speech, probably more than a lot of people that I'm seeing in this industry, just because I, I worry about the gatekeepers. You know, I worry about someone saying, you can't do this to somebody, and then it being turned around and kind of blasted back on people it wasn't intended for. My husband was listening to an interview with this guy who apparently used to be the head of the ACLU 
And I don't know anything more about him, but I was just listening to this interview and he was talking about some college campus and they had, this was maybe a few decades, decades ago, I think, they had, you know, put up some, some rules about, um, like behavior and, um, like a code of conduct type of thing. And so they, group, different groups of people were involved in this. And one group was some, he called them Zionists. I don't know if they were Israeli students or they were just Jewish, but the term was Zionists. And they were part of this legislation for like equality and, you know, anti, uh, racism and all of that stuff. And then a few years later, that same legislation was used against Zionists because they were considered to be racist for their treatment against Palestinians. And that kind of thing is what happens. Like things turn back on themselves. And like, who is, is the person deciding what your, what if your behavior is okay or not? You have to really look at that. Like, can this be turned around on me because of my beliefs and my ethnicity, tradition, marginalization, whatever it is? And that is the thing that worries me and that I think about. So as we kind of try to lock things down and make things safer and, um, you know, prevent harm to people, I think the motives are good. But if you really look at what the actual outcomes can be when someone turns it on you, is that the best way forward? Or should we just let everyone say whatever they want to say, no matter how hateful and harmful and horrible we think it is, because we want the ability to say whatever we want to say also. And that's kind of where I come down on it. But it's fraught and it's difficult and it's painful. And we all walk on eggshells because I think well-intentioned people want to do the right thing and well-intentioned people want to protect other people and give voices to people who haven't had voices. And that's all really great. But you put up too many rules. Just like in, in the news, they're talking about um, trying to have anti-domestic terror legislation. And then some civil rights people are like, hey, that kind of stuff actually harms black and brown people the most. So slow your roll. I see that. I definitely see that. It's tough out here, you know. All I can do is my best and try to be kind and follow the golden rule and like just at the core of everything, treat people how I want to be treated. Give people the benefit of the doubt if I would want it. And I don't know, that's the only thing I know how to do right now. So that is it for me for this week. Uh, goals for next week, keep plowing through this book. Keep doing research on the new project, the 1830s magical detective story, and I did not succeed in doing more work and getting more sleep. I think we kind of all knew that was going to happen. So I will focus on getting more sleep this week. Um, that is truly a goal because I'm feeling worn down and the next couple of months are going to be super busy. So I need to not feel worn down. Going to bed early is so difficult. I'm going to try to do it though. I have been getting through my to-do lists though, which is nice, mostly through them. I, I pushed one thing to today that I actually have to finish now, so. Progress, a few steps forward, one step back. That's how it goes. I hope that you have a wonderful week and I will talk to you next week. For episode show notes and to sign up for the Footnotes newsletter, go to myimaginaryfriendsshow.com. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and watch the video episodes on YouTube. I would really appreciate a rating or review to help support the show. And My Imaginary Friends is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. For more fantastic podcasts, go to frolic.media slash podcasts.